Rebecca Sklute, who is Henrietta Lacks? Henry Lacks was a poor African-American tobacco farmer who uh, was raised in Southern Virginia and eventually moved up to Baltimore where she was diagnosed with cervical cancer at 30. And without her knowledge, her doctor took a small piece of her tumor and put it in a Petri dish and her cells became the first immortal human cell line ever grown in culture. Um, so scientists had been trying to grow cells for decades and it had never worked and no one knows entirely why but hers just never died. So her cells are still alive today, growing in laboratories around the world, though she died in 1951. And they became one of the most important things that happened in medicine. They were used to help develop the polio vaccine. They went up in the first space missions to see what would happen to human cells in zero gravity. Her cells were the first ever cloned. Her genes, some of the first ever mapped. I mean, the scientific landmarks that came from these cells just go on and on. And they're still being used today? Yep. They're still one of the most widely used cell lines. Yeah. And when, what's a cell line? A cell line is a, there are cells that live in the laboratory and grow indefinitely. So basically they will just keep, keep growing and multiplying and living outside of the body as long as you keep them fed and clean and the right temperature and everything. So they'll just live on forever. Why did the doctor take her cells? So her, this was at a point when scientists were trying to grow any cells they could get their hands on really. And so they had been taking samples from anyone who came into the hospital, lots of different hospitals. So scientists have taken hundreds of samples from people and they all died, their samples all died. But with their knowledge or without their knowledge? Pretty standard to do it without their knowledge, yeah. So very few people knew that this was happening. And this was in the 30s and 40s? This was in the 50s. 50s. So yeah, 1951 was the year that the cells were taken. And yeah, it was standard practice at the time. Okay. And in some ways still is today. I mean, a lot of people have their tissues used in research now and don't really realize it. And why from a tumor? Um, well, there was a specific study going on at Hopkins looking at cervical cancer. This was right, the pap smear hadn't, had been developed not long before this, and science, so doctors could take the cells from the cervix and look at them under a microscope to diagnose cancer, but they didn't really know what they were looking for. So there was really widespread misdiagnosis, and so they were taking these cervical cancer cells specifically so that they could establish what, we, what they were looking for with the pap smear. Um, so that's why cervical cancer cells specifically, but more generally, they were just trying to grow any cancer cells they could because, you know, at this point, we, they didn't know anything about cancer. They didn't even know what DNA was. They, they had no idea what, how cancer cells behave differently than normal cells and, you know, how they spread so fast. And so part of it was that they wanted to grow cancer cells so they could figure out what cancer really was. What's the medicinal value then of cancer cells? Yeah, I often get this question of like, how did cancer cells help the polio vaccine? It seems like a complete disconnect. But, so there are a lot of different ways. And one of them is that they, they do have a lot of things about them that are normal. They have abnormal gene, you know, DNA, but you know, they still metabolize and they produce protein, you know, energy and um, they have cell membranes that function like normal cells. So you can study what's normal about a cancer cell and apply that to any cell. But they also, they work as little factories. So if you infect HeLa cells with a virus, like polio, the cells grow and grow and grow, and the virus will reproduce in the cells. And so you can mass produce vi viruses and extract them from the cells. So they work as little factories. But just sort of more generally, they are, they're just really widely studied. So they're sort of a baseline for any research. Scientists know how HeLa cells behave, and they sort of know what to expect from them in a dish. So if they then expose them to a drug or you know, something else and the cells react, they know what they're starting from so they can see how it changes. So there are a lot of different ways. What are the theories uh, for the reasons that her cells survived? There really aren't any. Um, we know that she had HPV, which is the virus that causes cervical cancer, and that that HPV sort of inserts itself into your, into your DNA and changes it, and that's how it causes cancer. So there was something about the HPV and how it interacted with her cells that caused the cancer itself to be very virulent. She had, she was 30 years old, she had a nickel-sized tumor is when that, they found is it. That big? The, yeah, it's, yeah, it's not huge, but it went, the, the more sort of amazing thing is it went from that nickel size, within six months every organ in her body had been taken over by cancer. So it grew very fast, more than her doctor had ever seen before. So there was something special about her tumor. Um, we know that there's an enzyme in the cells that 
rebuilds the chromosomes as they, so they don't age. They just sort of stay young and never die. But why her cells do that and others didn't is still a little bit of a mystery. Tell us about her family. Tell us about her background, first yeah. of all. You said she was a uh, tobacco farmer in Southern yeah. Virginia, but yeah. a little bit more information. Yeah, I mean, she came from, you know, she worked the same farm land that her ancestors has, had farmed as slaves. They were, you know, a very impoverished family for many generations. And she moved up to Baltimore in the 40s because their tobacco farms were dried up and they, her husband found work in Baltimore. So that's how she ended up at Hopkins. Um, and, you know, she, she had five kids by the time she died at 30. Um, and she was just this a caretaker. She wanted more children. She was very devoted to her kids. She was also a person who, if you were in Baltimore and you didn't have any money and you needed a place to stay, you slept on her floor. And if you were hungry, there was always a pot of food on the stove and she would feed you. You know, if you needed a girlfriend, she'd find you one. Like she was just this, this sort of super mom to everyone. So for her family, you know, the fact that her cells are really taking care of so many people and they've helped so many people sort of makes sense in terms of her personality and what she would have done. Her family very much sees these cells as Henrietta. Uh, they believe her soul is very much alive in the cells and um, that she was sort of brought back as an angel to take care of people. And you know, the, the family has very conflicted feelings about the cells. All five kids still living? No, there are three kids still alive today. and. They, her family didn't know the cells had been taken until the 70s. So How did they find out? Scientists, after the cells had grown, the scientists, they hadn't ever really seen other cells like them. And to learn more about the cells, some scientists decided to track down her kids and do research on them in order to understand the cells. So her husband, who had a third grade education, and he didn't know what a cell was, got this phone call one day. And the way he understood it was, we've got your wife. She's alive in the laboratory. We've been doing research on her for the last 25 years, and now we have to test your kids to see if they have cancer. None of which the scientists said, um, but you know, he thought they had her in a cell. That was his only un understanding of the word cell. So her family got, got sucked into this world of research that they didn't understand, and the scientists didn't realize the family didn't understand, and it had some pretty dramatic effects on her family. Um, and they've sort of been struggling with it ever since for a lot of different reasons, some of them just very emotional. Uh, you know, her daughter Deborah very much believes her mother's alive in those cells and she would ask the scientists questions like, if you're sending her cells up into space, can she rest in peace? And when you inject them with these chemicals, does that somehow hurt her? Um, and Henrietta's sons found out fairly early on that Henrietta's cells were also the first ever commercialized. So they are bought and sold. A multi-billion dollar industry grew out of selling these cells. And her family can't afford health insurance. And they're, they're quite poor. And they often say, you know, if our mother was so important to medicine, why can't we go to the doctor? So they've never gotten an answer to that question. Has there any been, been ever any litigation? No, not, with, not from the family. It, there have been why? other... Um, some of it is access to legal counsel. They didn't ever have that. Um, but also, there have been other cases in the past where people have sued over ownership of their cells. A man who found out that his doctor had patented his cells without his knowledge and they were worth billions of dollars. It's very rare that that happens. Most cells are worth nothing. But And the courts have always ruled against the people who the cells come from. So the, the way that the case law stands is that you don't have property rights in your tissues once they leave your body. What's the, uh, uh, is that, is it, that's how the, that's the, the courts have ruled? Today, yeah. What about the Johns Hopkins doctor who took these? Who was that? Tell us about him. Um, well, there were a lot of them. So there was a sort of team of doctors. Um, Howard Jones was her initial doctor who saw the, the tumor and, and diagnosed it. Um, and there was this team at Hopkins who was doing this research on the cervical cancer. Um, you know, and the scientist who grew the cells was different from her doctor, so they took the cells and gave them to the scientist, and he gave them all away for free. He, no one ever patented the cells. That wasn't something you did in the 50s, so he just gave them to anyone who what he thought would use them for science, and um, they very quickly went all over the world. At one point, a factory was set up where they were mass produced to the tune of about three trillion cells a week. So the volume of these cells produced is just kind of incomprehensible. Well